Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. Once upon a time, there was a poor and common man named Matthew Maul who owned a couple of acres that were desired by a rich and titled man named Colonel Pinchian, who wished to build a house on the property. Since the colonel could not acquire the land by lawful means, he took others. The year was 1650, and he connived to have Matthew Maul declared a wizard, condemned to die on the scaffold, which is where our story begins. You have not heard the last of Matthew Maul. You or your children, or your children's children. In particular, you, Colonel Pynchon, and all the family who follows you. Look at him, everyone, as a dying man makes a promise. Colonel Pynchon, God will give you and yours blood to drink. <laughs> My long revenge, which began with the moment my adversary first entered his new-built house, with his portrait locked into the paneling above his desk chair. For there, the first of the pensions, the Colonel Pension who sent me to my death, was found dead, drowned in his own blood. The doctors called it apoplexy, but we know better. Death brought him blood to drink, the first of much. For his house was doomed. Our mystery drama, The House of the Seven Gables, was especially adapted from the Nathaniel Hawthorne classic for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Norman Rose. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Halfway down a by street in one of our New England towns stands a rusty wooden house with seven acutely peaked gables facing towards various points of the compass and a huge clustered chimney in the midst. So begins the second novel written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And to tell you the rest of it, here is the tortured, uneasy spirit of the wizard Matthew Maul, who died before his time and left a curse that endured for over two centuries. Thirty-eight years in my grave, and yet I rise from it as casually as an ordinary man from his bed. I am seen as easily at noon as I am by the witching hour. I am an extraordinarily pestilent ghost, and I have left an estate which will mangle and torture and destroy at last the whole clan of Finchon. Shall we take a case in point? Yes? Well? Well, what is it? Uh, you sent for me, Mr. Finchon. The name is Matthew Maul, son of him who built this house for your grandfather. Grandson of the rightful proprietor of your soil. Oh, the ancient dispute. That matter has been settled by competent legal authorities. In favor of the family pension. Self-evidently. I am in residence and you are not. Then stay here and rot. Uh, a, a, a moment, Mr. Maul. Will you attend me in the living room? At your request. <laughs> to what purpose? Well, perhaps to your... To our mutual interest... There's a legend that my family, that, to be precise, the same Colonel Pynchon who looks down on us from above the living room fireplace here, has a deed to certain vast real estate holdings from an Indian grant. Holdings of incalculable value. I've heard the story. Are you also aware that in the settlement of the estate, no deed was found to lay claim to them? Oh, yes. But his claim was on the verge of settlements when my grandfather died suddenly. In answer to my grandfather's curse. 
of apoplexy. Which is, in non-medical terms, not far from literally drinking one's own blood. I did not get you here to renew old quarrels. Simply to make you a proposition. Very well, I'm listening. There's a rumor that whatever quarrel lay between our ancestors, yours was the one made the best bargain in the long run. By being hanged? However he died, he was only a step or two ahead of the colonel. For while the colonel won out in buying and owning the land Seven Gables stands on, he lost a kingdom when the deed to half the state of Massachusetts was lost. Or hidden. Uh, Mr. Pynchon, what is your proposition? Your father was the architect of this house. He might have secreted the paper somewhere or built some hidden chamber for them, which my ancestor, Colonel Pynchon, died to suddenly to reveal. I would be willing to pay well for information leading to them. I cannot believe the Colonel would have concealed something that was not his to hide. Uh, but uh, there might be a chance for you to recover those papers. Hmm? How? I'll make a contract with you. This house and the property for the papers, if I can locate them. No! No! Damn me! If I'll permit it! Did you say something, sir? No. Why? Well, I could have sworn I heard a voice. Well, I'll meet your bargain if you can find the Indian Grant. I'll need some help. I don't know where the papers are. Or if they exist. I do know that to locate them, I need the help of a medium. I don't understand. You have a young daughter named Alice. Bring her here. From outside the Orion window, hoard with frost against the roaring fire within, I watched my grandson toy with this pension whose only desire was to flee the dread house and live abroad. And by virtue of my right as a man taken before his time, I kept invading Matthew's mind and making it mine as far as I desired. My uh, daughter, Alice, may I present Mr. Uh, Matthew Maul? My pleasure, Mr. Maul. Will you be seated? Father? Do as he asks. Very well. Now, I ask you to... Fix your eyes on mine. <laughs> From the moment that gentle girl raised her eyes, she was ours, mine. It was enough, perhaps, that already the mall had the reputation that they could enter people's dreams and that no grave could hold them. By now, there was a further belief that they could mesmerize the unwary there is your daughter, Mr. Pynchon. Speak to her. Alice! Alice, answer me! Oh, softly, softly, Mr. Pynchon. Is it my crime you have sold your daughter for the hope of getting back a sheet of yellow parchment? Well, what would you do with her? Why, only as you asked. Use her as a medium to try to make you rich. How? You'll see. Unless you wish to call our barter deal off. Very well. Listen to me, Alice Pynchon. Listen with your mind. Cast off your body. Think. Think back away through the years, but cling to me. Let him who holds the secret of the Indian land deeds come forth peaceably and without delay. Call him. I know not who he is. Then ask. Colonel Pynchon? Great-grandfather, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Call on my grandfather, whom your great-grandfather hanged. Matthew Moore? Matthew Moore? Are you there? Speak. I hear you in the grave, Miss Pinson. Oh, what rare sport to watch your father. 
Father Gervais, shivering in mortal dread. And you, my fine lady, no more responsible for your actions than a puppet. And my grandson, speaking words and using powers only I could confer on him. But the secret? <laughs> the secret I am not yet ready to divulge. <laughs> Enough! Enough! Would you kill the child? Bring her to... Without your answer? Have you not found it? Only this. Your grandfather's secret is one he must choke with until it is of no further value. So, keep a house of seven gables. Wake my daughter from her trance. As far as I can. What mean you? Well, she will walk and live and breathe. Uh, but... But what, man? I, I meant no harm. I meant only to humble you and yours. I did not mean to steal her soul, but... I'm afraid that is lost. The years rolled by. And generation by generation, I took my toll on the pension brood... The once proud family dwindled and thinned out. I have had little need to move my rusty bones or decaying flesh since they have wrought their own destruction, save till now. But in this century, I must arise again. Ah, Cousin Hepzibah. Jaffrey Pinchon, what brings you to Seven Gables? Why, I take it since you have opened a one-cent store, it is open to any member of the public? Not to you. Never to you. Judge. Judge not that ye shall be judged. Well, surely after all these years, and in respect of what I've just arranged for Clifford... You are not welcome in this house. Not even in a public shop, Hepzibah Pinchon. The shop is a necessity. Now, more than ever. Because of Clifford's return? Or oh, surely you know if you're in need, you can call on me. Or bring your brother and yourself to live on my estate. Oh, you know I will take no charity from you, now or ever. How dare you offer it, after what you've done to Clifford? I? Yes, you hate him. For what reason, I know not. But hate him, you do. You do me wrong, sweet cousin. But I am a forbearing man. I, I bear what crosses God sends me to bear. I will not trouble you more now, but wait for Clifford's return. Four pensions are left. Near-sighted, angular, tall Hepzibah in her rusty black. The smiling, fat, oily Judge Jaffrey Pynchon, who so closely resembles the portrait of that black-hearted colonel who hangs in a massive gold frame in the living room and who hangs me by the living neck. Two yet we are still to meet. Bless my soul, the omnibus. It's stopping before my shop door. It can't be Clifford yet. No. Then, then who is it? Cousin Hepzibah. Cousin Hepzibah. Well, don't you know me? Cousin? Oh, no pension ever looked as lovely as you, child. <laughs> cousin Hepzibah, you flatter me. But you can't deny it. I am your country cousin. And my mother sends you her love and regard and hopes my visit to you will not put you out. Your visit? You, you intend to stay? Didn't you get my mother's letter? No. I don't understand about the matter. Oh, it doesn't matter now. You're here. But, child, I, I don't see how you can stay. Oh, I don't expect to be a guest. I mean to earn my bread. I can find plenty to do, cousin. The garden and flowers and the chickens will keep me out in the open air. And I can't help in the shop. Please let me stay. Well, you, you, you can stay at least the night. But in any case... The decision whether or not you remain at the House of Seven Gables is not up to me. Tomorrow, its master returns home. My brother Clifford, who is coming home at last. I think I remember my mother and father mentioning him, but as though he were dead. 
Where has he been? In prison. Prison? Why? For the murder of our uncle, the judge's father, Jeffrey Kinchin. One other young and unsuspecting girl, Alice Pynchon, came to grief under the shadowed gables of this brooding old house. Is another to share the same fate? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. This is not my story, so let me quote from the man who first told it. The mysterious Clifford is about to return, and here is how he is foreshadowed in conversation between Miss Hepzibah Pynchon and the newly arrived Phoebe. Thirty-one years ago, my uncle, master of this house, was found dead beneath the portrait of our ancestor, Colonel Pynchon. Death was accountable. The authorities decided to a blow on the head. Since the desk in his private papers had been rifled, it was suspected that it was robbery and accidental murder committed to avoid discovery. My cousin Cliff, oh, I shall never believe that. Oh, you will see for yourself when he returns how, how gentle, sweet, unworldly. Oh, Clifford could never have been guilty. I'm sure from that kindly face you showed me in the miniature he was wrongly judged. No question of that. Just as I am sure that Cousin Jeffrey, why I cannot understand was the one most instrumental in sending him there. How could that be? It was he who discovered Clifford by the rifle desk, our uncle lying on... <laughs> oh, hush. Dear Cousin Hepzibah, yeah. think of the present and not on the past. Soon Cousin Clifford will be home again. But surely it grows very late if he's coming today. Oh, well, you... You'd best off to bed. Perhaps I should greet him alone. <laughs> How shall I manage? May I help, Cousin Heather? Oh, 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 I'm all sums when it comes to cookery. You see, I, I, I've lost whatever heart I had all these years alone. And I wanted Clifford's first breakfast to be so tasty. You have a fire going bright enough to chase the morning dusk. Since the oven is hot, would you like me to bake an Indian cake? Oh, oh, it was Clifford's favorite all those years ago. Well, then bake it, I shall. What else can I do? Oh, well, Coffee. Real mocha, if you would grind it. We'll make a breakfast fit for a king. A tired, sad king. Worn out by exile. Is he not well? You shall see for yourself soon enough, dear Phoebe. Oh, oh, hush, hush, he's coming. Oh, let him see you first, Phoebe. He likes bright faces. And mine is old, set in a scowl. Clifford. Dear, oh, let, let me help you. <clears throat> the weakness is locked inside, Hepzibah. Nothing you or anyone can help. But we are not alone. No, he's, he's Phoebe. Phoebe, Arthur's only child. You remember I, I told you about her last night. Phoebe. Phoebe Pynchon. Phoebe. Ah, Arthur's child. Yes, I forget. You are welcome. Thank you, Cousin Clifford. Oh, come sit here. Take this chair. Is this you, Hepzibah? How changed. How changed. And are you angry with me? Oh, why should I be angry? And why do you bend your brows so? Oh, Clifford, there is nothing but love here. If I scowl, it is only habit that has gone before. Cousin Hepzibah is only worried and concerned that you should be happy. Then why do we keep that odious picture on the wall? Why can't we get you? What is that sound? Why, that is... Uh, Phoebe, will you answer it? Of course. That is the tinkle of the shop bell. Shop bell? Yes, sir. Ah, oh, then. Has Miss Hepzibah's shop opened under such favorable circumstances that she needs an assistant as attractive as you? I'm a cousin of hers, on a visit from the country. Well, in that case, I suspect you are a kinsman of mine. Let's see. Um, oh, yes, yes, 
nice little Phoebe Pinson. I am your kinsman, Judge Pinson. My little niece. Oh, surely I must pay you welcome. Uh, oh, you resist me. I had not meant to. Oh, quite right, quite right. A young girl, especially a very pretty one, cannot but be chary of her lips. I did not mean to be unkind. Oh, I accept that. But are you afraid of something? Nothing I know of. I'll just step in and... What do you want, Joffrey? Why, simply a short visit with my... No. He cannot... See I warned you to take care. Clifford is on the brink of a blacker fate than yet possessed him. I need to see him. No, no, Esther, don't let him in. Take him on your knees if you must. Ask him to have mercy, mercy. You heard. I heard. But must I? You will not let me see him. I want to protect him. As you will. But you do me great wrong, cousin. I only wish to help him. I will find some other way. He seemed kind. Is his offer of help so wicked? Oh, Phoebe, he has a heart of iron. Oh, let me go back to rejoin my poor brother at breakfast. Of all of us, he's the one who most needs protection now. <laughs> Do it, lady. What? Drink from that. Or even wash your face. I was only looking at my reflection in it. May I ask who you are, sir? Oh, forgive me. Uh, Miss Pynchon has not mentioned me. Mr. Holgate, the boarder. The same at your service. And you must be Miss Phoebe. <laughs> Which gable is yours? Oh, my window is the one. Perhaps it is more seemly to ask the question of you, sir. Well, by all means. I count mine the seventh, since it is by all odds the most remote and separate. See, up yonder, beyond the eaves. You live there all along? A question hard to answer, Miss Phoebe. Why? In the house of the seven gables, is anyone truly alone? It's hard to tell whether the rats outnumber the ghosts, or vice versa. Then why pick it as a lodging by free will? If you must know, I can afford little, and the rent suits my purse. The house also suits my profession. Your profession? Mm -hmm. I'm a maker of daguerreotypes. How fascinating. Can you really point a machine at someone and make a likeness of them? I can. Do you doubt it? Why, I... It sounds like a kind of magic to me. Technically, in its way. But the result is a quite faithful reproduction of the subject. For example, uh, this. Oh, you created this? I recreated this, shall we say. It is a likeness. Never mind the likeness. Miss Phoebe, look deeper. What kind of man is this? Why, by all effects, a man of probity, of kindness, of property. Is the picture of that alone? Or can one look deeper? Not knowing the subject, I don't see how. Look at that eye. In the midst of a sunny countenance, speaking of an open heart. And yet, observe carefully the cast in the eye, the line of jaw, the subtle twist of mouth. Here is the man, the true man, sly, subtle, imperious, hard, and with all as cold as ice. Do you recognize him now? Judge Pynchon. Still, there's some other resemblance. The daguerreotype is of the living judge. The resemblance is quite marked. Give or take the style of whisker, the fashion of cloth, the bloat of jowl. It could be the original Colonel Pynchon who choked on his own blood. Why have you this picture? For the same reason, I wish to have all the Pynchon clan. Miss Phoebe, will you sit for me sometime? I? In any history, one must balance the good against the bad. Who are you? A recorder of history by choice. Miss Hepzibah's lodger by chance. Will you sit for my portrait of you? To what end? That is beyond my power to say at this moment. Only that I can promise you, you are safe from any harm. 
And what do I get out of it? Well, first, what you put into it. Second, a record of your beauty. And third... And third? No less than your future. One way or another. Then how can I refuse? My object was to make sure, as best I could, that you shouldn't... For once, I was resting more secure in my rotting grave. The urge to wander grasped me less. The Pynchon dynasty was a sorry lot at best, save one. And a new dynamic force was guiding my course to its resolution. It was time to start to pull my winding sheet more closely about me and begin to leave the future to itself. But not yet. The curse was not yet played out. The mysterious Mr. Holgrave. Who is he? What threat does he pose to Phoebe? Perhaps the only breath of sanity to blow sweetly through the dusty corridors and winding staircases of both the Pinchian history and the house that encloses the living, as tight and inescapable as the coffin in the grave. We'll return shortly with Act Three. For two centuries, the curse of the hanged wizard Matthew Maul has hung like a cloud over the House of the Seven Gables the dark, deteriorating, rat-infested, and ghost-ridden house has outlived its time. Only the family, to which it belongs, hangs on to some distant remnant of the past. There, Cousin Clifford, safe in your little eyrie and retreat. I trust you, Phoebe, to find me this spot in my private gable. Why, from here I can see all the world. The bustle of our little town, certainly. How free I feel after all those years. <laughs> I have the wildest impulse. What, Cousin Clifford? Are you too young, perhaps, to remember when we blew soap bubbles? A glass of soapy water. <laughs> and a clay pipe. Yeah, the pipe I still have. Well, the soapy water I can provide. But the lost years, where can they be found again? <laughs> wish his life were more than a, a shadowed gable overlooking the street. My cousin Hatsipa, to watch the whole stream of life flow by is at least an introduction to the thought of returning to it. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. Oh, here's your soapy water. Take it to him to, to blow bubbles. Good morning, Miss Phoebe. Mr. Holgrave, how can I thank you? For what? For answering to my cry. For helping me hold back my cousin Clifford. It's only fortunate that I was nearby. I don't know how to explain. Why should any of us try to explain the human effort, drive, psyche? We all react to our impulses and dreams to a greater or lesser degree. Did your cousin really want to jump? I was with him. I could scarce hold him. Why would he pretend? Why, indeed. At least there was no disaster. I'm glad I was part of avoiding that. I can never thank you enough. How can I do something in return? Sit for me. Let me make a daguerreotype of you. That's simple enough. But why? I wish I felt myself free to answer that completely, but... Well, at least one obvious reason. There should be some permanent record of your beauty. I'm afraid you overstate your case. Or my case. So I must admit that even if you had not half admitted it... I would suspect you of some ulterior purpose. You never have quite trusted me, have you? It's just that I sense you... You are not quite what you seem to be. But... Oh, I don't know what I feel. What do you want my image for? Well, say that I want a record of the Pynchon family. And that alone? No. My other purpose... I must keep to myself. I could refuse. I hope you won't. It would be ungracious of me. I offered to do something in return for helping save Cousin Clifford's life. When? The sooner the better. 
There is a skylight in my gable room. The afternoon light would be perfect. If you'll meet me there at five, I'll be ready for you. I never thought to see the day I would harbor any kindly thoughts or any tension. But I find I have it in my heart to accept poor, withered Hepzibah and a half-mad Clifford. And as for Phoebe, well... She shall have an unseen protector observing from beyond the skylight window. There now, Miss Phoebe, we're ready to begin. Should we not have the door open and the windows unshuttered? Oh, no, 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 no. I want no other light source than what strikes across my shoulder to you from above. And we must catch it now. All right, are you ready? What must I do? Well, lift your eyes to mine, above the lens. Relax. Think of something soothing. Blue sky. The ripples on a sunlit pond. Oh, yes. Yes, that's lovely. Don't try to smile. Just stay in repose. When I expose the plate, you must not move for 20 to 30 seconds. Now, take a deep, slow breath and hold it. Now. Now the plate is exposed copper on which a film of silvered iodide has been formed by iodine vapor. The sands are dropping through my minute glass, and slowly, slowly, your image develops on the plate. This one half minute, I hold you mesmerized, only to make you immortal, never to be forgotten, to last till the end of time. Now you may relax. It's all over. Phoebe? 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 I've mesmerized her. Phoebe! Oh, God help me to resist my evil desire. Phoebe! Phoebe! Forgive me if, if now I say what I have not dared to say to you, nor ever will, perhaps, so long as you are a pension. Phoebe, I love you. Love you with all my heart. Have loved you since that first moment I saw you in the garden. I have not, cannot dare to hope when all is known that you could return that love. Yet here, at this moment, with you completely in my power, I could cast a spell on you that would hold you forever mine. No. No, Phoebe. Rather that you were never mine than to hold you bound to me against your will. Phoebe Pynchon, can you hear me? I hear you. You are safe. You know that. Safe. You will have no memory of the trance you are in now. No memory. And when you wake, you will feel refreshed. And your same lovely self. You promise me? I promise. Then, when I snap my fingers, wake. Is my portrait all finished? Yes, Phoebe. May I see it? Oh, no. I, I, I have much to do before that. This one, I, I, I want to color. I would not have you see it in black and white. Oh, then I shall have to wait to look at it till I return. Return? I must go home to visit my mother and father. And bring back the rest of my clothes. You intend to stay on Seven Gables, then? Cousin Clifford needs me. And Cousin Hepzibah. I think it is my duty. To wither and dry up like them? Before God, I pray you find some better fate. <laughs> some better fate indeed. Back in my grave, my bones are ready to settle to eternal sleep, and the curse is ready to be wound up. And the day after Phoebe left became the beginning of the end. Look at him, striding along the street toward the one-cent shop. The picture of a man who owns most of the world and who intends to clutch the rest of it to him. The 200-year reincarnation of the pension who put me six feet under. Judge Jaffrey Pinchon. <laughs> Judge Pinchon. Yes, Cousin Hepzibah, the same. What do you want? Well, what else, cousin, but they've done with all this? I want to see Clifford. No. It is my purpose to do so before I leave this house. Haven't you done enough to him? 
Thirty years ago, our uncle died. His immense fortune was left to me, save for your life interest in this property and the house of the Seven Gables. To Clifford, not to me. Some months before our mutual uncle's death, Clifford boasted to me that he knew the secret of incalculable wealth. I believe that at this moment, if Clifford retain his wit and, if he chooses, he can tell me where the riches can be found if, if he chooses. And if he can't or doesn't? Back to the dungeon. I'll await your bringing him in here in the old colonel's chair. It should in any case have been mine by right. Oh, I wish you ill of it. But I shall go find Clifford. So come the years full circle. Revenge is as dusty in my mouth as these old bones which moldering cry for eternal rest. Only one more remains who deserves his fate. The same one that overwhelmed his liberate ancestor, who still pouts like a peacock in the frame of a portrait behind the judge's head. God give him blood to drink. No, no, no. My, my, my watch. Whip, whip. I, I, I have appointments to keep important things to do. I, I, I can't. I, 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 I can't. I'm Drink deep and die, and dies the curse with you. I, I found him here, Phoebe, dead of apoplexy, the last of his line. But Hepzibah and Cousin Clifford... They inherit the judge's country estate, bright with sunlight, with no dark gables to hem them in. I've already moved them there. I'm so bewildered. What shall I do now? Phoebe, I have an offer. What? Well, first, let me reveal who I am and what I know. A two-century-old secret guarded to prove that might is not always right. Look, the curlicue pattern around the portrait. So many bits of detail. And only one that holds the power to... Open the vault where the ancient document lies behind the portrait. All that blood for a piece of parchment, clothed in the dust of 200 years and not worth even the paper it's written on. A sad and silly secret handed down to me. But who are you? Like you, the last of the pensions, I am the last of the malls. Matthew Mall, and with the end of the family curse, I feel reborn. Or will if... If what? Matthew. Shall we end it all? Will you marry me, Phoebe, whom I love beyond all, and put an end for good to family feuds and tragic doom? Oh, yes, Matthew. Yes. On one condition. You have only to ask. That we leave and shut up forever the House of the Seven Gables. For several years, the house still stood. There were those who, passing it after dark, swore they could hear the tinkle of the harpsichord Alice Pynchon once used to play, the sound of the one-cent shop bell, the cough of a man choking. But in a very few years, this had little of flesh or blood left in it, like all legends about haunted houses. This one's only special claim to fame was that it had... If you counted them, seven gables. I'll be back shortly. It should come as no surprise that Judge Jaffrey Pynchon was the one who really murdered his uncle. To have made gentle Clifford the scapegoat was reason enough for Matthew Maul to reach that powerful hand once more from the grave and exact what so seldom happens to the villains of this world. Due retribution. Our cast included Norman Rose, Arnold Moss, Bryna Rayburn, Jada Rowland, and Stats Cosworth. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>